Hello world, welcome to our discussion about the future of digital identity. As you can see from the experts we've convened here, you're in for a rare treat. My name is Adam Rosenzweig and it's my privilege to lead Okta's product impact programs as a member of the Okta for Good team. I'll be facilitating this session. I encourage all of you to join us in the live chat if you have questions or want to speak with any of the panelists. Before I invite our guests to introduce themselves and their work to you, I'd like to ask you watching this video a question. If you needed to, how might you prove who you are? Think about the artifacts, the mechanisms, the systems that you rely on to verify your identity. If you're watching this session, then you probably use some form of identity several times each day. Identity is increasingly central to everything we do. Accessing healthcare, participating in democracy, protecting our finances. Modern life requires identity. For most of us, it's almost impossible to imagine how we live our lives without verifiable forms of identification. And yet that's the situation for more than a billion people around the world right now as I speak. About half of those people are in Africa. This issue disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, including people in poverty, people living in rural and remote areas, women and children, stateless persons, migrants, persons with disabilities, etc. Globalization is making the world smaller every day, which means the problems at this scale are actually everyone's problem. But if that feels like an overwhelming challenge, I want to suggest that it's also a compelling opportunity. Solving identity challenges unlocks critical resources and creates new markets and helps protect the most vulnerable people. It's no exaggeration to say that identity changes the world. There may be no single factor that affects a person's ability to share in the gains of global development, as much as having an official identity. So today's conversation focuses on digital identity. We've convened a group of experts who are working on the front lines of digital ID, but from different angles. Digital ID doesn't have a single universal definition. Rather, experts prefer to define various characteristics of good digital ID implementations. And while that may be somewhat unsatisfying, I can say at least one thing for certain. Digital identity will either play a role in solving the world's inequalities, or be defined by them. Those are the stakes for all of us and all of you who are building, buying, or otherwise influencing the future of digital identity. So here's how the rest of this session is gonna work. I've asked each of our panelists to briefly share one challenge and one opportunity related to digital identity from their work. Once they've each had a chance to present, we'll have a conversation. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Dr. Amy Paul, Emerging Technology Advisor at USAID. Great, thank you so much, Adam, and thanks everyone for joining the conversation today. Um, as Adam said, I am a technical advisor at USAID and in our innovation technology and research hub. And I have the pleasure of working on a team whose role is to really look at the way that we are using digital technology in our programming or could be, and think about how we responsibly contribute to a broader ecosystem of technology use in the countries in which we work. As Adam mentioned at the beginning, there are so many ways in which identity features into the lives that we all lead, and that's true in development as well. Um, when we think about identity systems and development, that can mean the ability to participate in uh, political systems through the ability to vote. It can mean access to essential services like health and um, social protections. It can mean digital financial inclusion. And so as we've gone forward in our work, we start to see examples of digital identity systems in USAID programming. And on the slide here, you're seeing just a few examples of where some of those systems have featured uh, across multiple different sectors. One of the challenges that we face is that within the development work that we do, we see lots of different kinds of systems and they're often viewed through the sectoral lens of that program. So we don't often have folks that think only about digital identity. We have health experts and humanitarian assistance experts and democracy and governance experts. And most of the time, digital identity systems, while they may play a very important role in that program, are kind of buried underneath, uh, or at least serving as the foundation of doing that work and not necessarily the focus of it. And in some ways that can create challenges because we don't have one view across all of these sectors of how much digital identity systems are um, playing a role in the work that we do. That means that within these programs, we're often 
creating um, digital identity systems or relying on them in a fragmented or um, functional way. So you have a separate one for each new program that we do. And this leads to, to multiple challenges. It can mean that we have this fragmented ecosystem, as, as Adam hinted at, in meaning that we have beneficiaries or recipients in our programs who have to manage three, four, five, and more ID systems, depending on um, you know, the kinds of services that they receive and the, and the different roles that it plays in their lives. We have uh, redundant investments. If you, you know, are making the same kind of investment in an ID system over and over again, rather than being able to reuse one that may have been made in the program in the past. And then again, the more that we collect information about individuals in our programs, the more um, effort you have to put into managing and protecting that information uh, securely. And the more that we, that we collect and create it, you create more opportunities for that to potentially um, be mismanaged at some point in the future. In addition, um, as Adam again mentioned at the beginning, we are operating in this global context where there are over a billion people who lack any form of official ID, the majority of those living in low and middle income countries. And so where there are opportunities for us to be able to plug into existing systems and start to bridge that gap, that can be a very uh, a good option. Um, but we know that not all ID systems are the same, right? And increasingly in the countries where we work, we have to think about potential risks that might come along with um, sharing information in uh, large national ID systems, whether that comes from existing in a political environment, um, not having the capacity to, again, securely protect and maintain that information, um, working with systems that may not necessarily have been designed for inclusion, um, and, and its ability to actually serve the, the program recipients that, that we work with. So this is all leading up to a very complicated ecosystem of thinking about who are the actors and the players in digital identity systems. And for us at USAID, needing to understand how we fit in that so that we can be responsible both where ID systems work in our programs and where we have opportunities to, to contribute to that ecosystem that is in the end inclusive, um, protects people's information appropriately and really does open up those avenues of opportunity um, that we wanted to. So that's kind of the challenge where we are starting at. One big opportunity that we have is the launch of USAID's first ever digital strategy, which happened in April of 2020, where we're really taking a focus on understanding both how to use digital technology within our programming and how that fits in broader digital ecosystems, understanding what those other players, whether they're civil society, private sector, or country governments are doing. Um, if we think about what a, a digital ecosystem means, it really is um, comprehensive of thinking about aspects of these three main pillars that you see of infrastructure action and, and use, of digital society and governance, and of digital economies. And we're looking at digital ID systems as one of the key features within these systems. You'll see ID systems featuring as a, as a main uh, component of what a digital ecosystem is and recognizing that this is sitting in a broader country context. And when we think about our role in digital, um, digital ecosystems and digital identity systems, pointing out the interconnections with all of these different factors, whether that's understanding, do we have the actual infrastructure that's gonna support the use of an ID system? Are we thinking through the cybersecurity and privacy considerations and the capacity of our partners to do that so that information is protected securely? Are we actually building use cases and business models where those ID systems are going to be connected and open up opportunities, for example, in the digital economy? And so with the launch of the digital strategy, we have a couple of initiatives that are really helping us understand these ecosystems and identify where those opportunities that intersect with our own programming and with um, sort of fortifying digital identity systems in the countries where we work sit. Um, one of those is through assessments. Um, that, that really help us understand what those dynamics are and what players we need to be working with. Also thinking about additional research, whether that's um, understanding user experiences, looking at policy levers, to get a full picture of what's going on in this ecosystem to understand where we best have opportunities, again, to be able to leverage digital ID systems in our programming to achieve our development goals, but also contribute to that broader country ecosystem. Again, seeking to have systems that are inclusive, that are safe and that do open up those opportunities for others. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Amy. It's my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Dakota Gruner. 
Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm Dakota Gruner, and I'm the executive director of ID2020, and I'm thrilled to be here um, recording this video today. So um, most of us take for granted the ability to prove who we are, um, and yet this seemingly basic function determines what rights and services we're able to access, or conversely, what is out of reach to us. And so being able to assert our identity, as Adam said in his intro remarks, allows each of us participating in this session to exercise a variety of rights and protections under the law, to access critical social services, participate fully as citizens and voters, and transact in an increasingly digital economy. Um, but as both Amy and Adam noted, today one in seven people on earth, fully 1.1 billion people, are unable to prove their identity through any recognized means. And something I'd wanna, I wanna spend most of my time today um, focused on is really the sort of uh, sudden urgency around digital identity and digital credentials vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19. Um, the pandemic has brought digital credentials into the public consciousness. Suddenly we're all carefully considering how we can prove various attributes about ourselves, including proof of a negative COVID test or proof of vaccination, in a secure, portable, and verifiable manner. So whether you're living in a refugee camp in Thailand, whether you're homeless in the United States, whether you simply need to prove your vaccination status to travel abroad or to you know, attend a, a, an event, digital ID, if developed and implemented responsibly and with the right guardrails in place, has the potential to increase access as well as improve the quality of a variety of critical services. Very quickly about ID2020. ID2020 was launched in 2016 to foster collaboration between the private sector, government, and nonprofit organizations towards a common vision. Good ID for all. But I think it's probably important to unpack what we mean by good ID. When we at ID2020 talk about good digital ID, we're referring to systems that are designed very intentionally to be privacy protecting, user controlled, and portable. These systems should allow us to assert our identity or an attribute about ourselves and to access services wherever, whenever, and with whom we choose. Ultimately, we should own our own personal data. ID2020 doesn't promote a specific technology, solution, or implementation. Rather, we're working across sectors towards a future in which a multitude of interoperable systems adhere to a common set of technical, ethical, and operational standards. And if designed based on interoperable and open standards, these systems could then be implemented by everyone from government agencies to NGOs. So realizing the full potential of good ID will require all of us, technology providers, policymakers, and civil society to collaborate and to quickly educate policymakers and the public to overcome any mistrust that could impede their broad adoption. I think this you know, really goes back to this sort of ecosystem map that Amy was just presenting. Um, getting to good ID for all requires simultaneous progress along multiple tracks. Um, we need to advance the underlying technology. We need to facilitate interoperability through the development of technology standards. We need to promote public and private sector implementations. Um, we need to put in place the necessary legal and regulatory frameworks. And finally, um, perhaps most importantly, but I'd argue least discussed, we need to work across sectors and with a wide array of stakeholders to build trust in these systems and support their adoption. Now with COVID-19, we stand at a unique moment in time where there's tremendous urgency for digital ID or digital credentialing solutions. Um, you know, around the world, we're hearing discussions of proof of COVID-19 vaccines, um, sometimes described as vaccine passports, or better manners to, for somebody to prove that they have been tested and received a negative test result. And what we see at the moment is that the paper-based certificates, um, you know, the carton issued by WHO, the yellow card, um, and required for travel to certain countries, while low cost and easy to distribute, these paper-based certificates are prone to loss, misuse, and fraud. And so there's been a huge amount of discussion um, by countries, by international actors, about how we do a better digitally enabled um, vaccine certificate or a better um, proof of testing. If done right, digital immunization certificates could offer a path to restoring global economic activity, resuming international travel, um, and you know, getting us back to some degree of normalcy. Um, but again, this is only going to be helpful if done very carefully, only if individuals can provide proof of vaccination across both institutional and geographic borders with complete control over what information they choose to disclose and with whom. 
and if those credentials are then recognized and trusted. So for those of us who work in digital ID, this is an exciting opportunity to step onto the public stage and to solve one of the most pressing challenges of our times. But while the rewards are high, so too are the stakes. It's hard to imagine a use case for digital ID beset by such a wide range of technical, ethical, legal, and operational challenges, all of which must be overcome. Um, and so as we speak, you know, we know that solution providers around the world are racing to develop credentialing solutions, um, sometimes absent the guidance and coordination necessary to ensure these systems are interoperable. They do protect patient privacy and civil liberties and that they serve the needs of all people, not just the privileged few. And so I would um, really say as a technology community, we have an obligation to put our best foot forward. Um, moving fast and breaking things cannot be our modus operandi in this case. The stakes are simply too high and the solutions that we adopt today are likely to be with us um, for a very, very long time. And this is where governments, other implementers and funders can play a critical role by taking the necessary time to establish standards and technical requirements for digital credentialing technologies, and then aligning incentives to ensure that solutions adhere to these standards. Um, it's my fervent hope that we will emerge from the other side of this pandemic with stronger systems and infrastructure that will not only contribute to greater resilience in the face of future pandemics, but also help build trust in digital ID for other use cases. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our next panelist, Julio Kapi. Hi, I'm the Global Digital Specialist for the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council works for millions of people uh, and interacts with millions of people across over 30 countries across the globe. And uh, we have 15,000 colleagues. Uh, that makes for a lot of identities, a lot of people, a lot of different names. And each one of them has a story. And we all know that each story is not just the name or the paper that is written on. When it comes to digital, it's even more complicated. As a global digital specialist, I have to advise and supervise and monitor and support uh, all sorts of projects. Uh, we are testing on biometrics, on artificial intelligence, on distributed ledger technologies. Uh, we are exploring ways to bring tenants and landlords together so that displaced people can uh, more easily manage their um, their um, rental situation to protect themselves. We're exploring uh, different forms of technologies because we believe that uh, we need to bring people the best possible service and the best possible service need to also rely on the best and most advanced tools. But this, as it has been said, comes with a risk. So we need to test, we need to experiment. We need to make sure that we know what we're dealing with. And, and we have a huge opportunity with the digital ID vision of uh, expanding the idea of, of a person that was not lucky enough to grow up in an environment where uh, a form of foundation or functional ID is accessible to everyone. That is a major opportunity. But we also have a major challenge, which is the risk of being carried away by a technocentric view of what digital ID should be. A vision or a board view that is led by those building the ID rather than those who are supposed to use it. And, and this is the major uh, challenge in front of us right now is, is try to understand what's in it for the people that are going to use. What's not just the triggering mechanism in kind of user experience terms. This is not, uh, this is not about how to get them hooked on a new system. It's the opposite, is to understand why should people need my service or use my service. When we led um, our research last year, exactly on the issue of digital ID, interviewing hundreds of people, nobody say that they need a digital ID. Everybody say that they need services, they need access to services. They need better goods and tools and opportunities. People don't need an ID. People need an ID for something. They already know their names. They already know who they are in society. And sometimes they don't trust the government or companies to tell them who they are through a digital ID service. So the challenge is, is right in front of us. And it's how do we square the circle between granting people access to services while at the same time respecting their will? 
uh, respecting what they really want, which has now become part of an ecosystem, but it's getting better options and better opportunities. So this is where at the Norwegian Refugee Council, we found ourselves a little bit like stuck in the middle. We do our best to connect with tech companies and, and, and donors and, and the international community and the researchers to understand what's out there. What are the best opportunities? What are the risks? But sometimes the biggest challenge is to really understand how do we translate that into something that is useful, that people want? How do we make it something? that people will be happy and feel safe in bringing with them or accessing. And again, it's not just the material aspect of it, but it's also the immaterial side of data running all over the place and being sold around. So we need to earn the trust of people when we talk about digital ID. How do we make people need something? How do we make them ask us for something? Um, how do we convince them to trust us with their ID? And that's pretty much the biggest challenge I can see in front of us. Thanks, Julio. I really appreciate you ending that by centering on trust. So last but certainly not least, I'd love to introduce our final panelist before our discussion, Safia Gurji. Hi, everyone. Uh... Happy to be here today. My name is Safia Virgi. I'm the Innovations Manager at the Kenya Red Cross Society. Um, and today I'll be sharing a little bit about what we've been doing with digital identities um, and some of the experiences that we've had and some of the challenges um, that we've faced. So the Kenya Red Cross Society is part of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Uh, and we work through the 47 counties in Kenya. So we have 47 branches, uh, very grassroots level working within the communities. Um, and we have over 150,000 volunteers. A lot of our work is focused on emergency uh, and disaster response. So focusing on preparedness, recovery, um, response and recovery. Uh, and recently, about two and a half years ago, uh, we set up an innovation department that looks at how can we incorporate emerging technologies and emerging approaches to improve our humanitarian assistance delivery. And how can we enhance the user experience and make sure that our communities are at the center of the work that we do. So a reason that we sort of went towards digital identities or I'd just even say digital cash transfer to start off with is because of the challenges faced with doing manual cash transfer. There was issues around um, fraud. There was issues around accountability and transparency. Uh, the efficiency of cash transfer was, uh, was a long process. And if we're talking about an emergency situation, it just wasn't ideal for any of the parties involved. So we decided to see um, what it would be like to incorporate uh, blockchain technology to enhance our cash transfer. And this was at around 2011. But as we got more digital and as we decided um, or as we worked towards doing cash transfer through mobile, a mobile payment platform, we realized that actually people that don't have a legally recognized ID can't access this um, assistance. So it's, it came a long way from doing cash handouts where we know a community member and they've been validated by the chief or the village elders. Uh, it, it went to now they're not legally recognized by the government. So how do we cash? How do we send the cash through through M-Pesa or mobile money? So we together with uh, the IFRC and uh, Norwegian humanitarian organizations such as um, Norwegian Red Cross, uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, Norwegian Church Aid and Save the Children Norway, uh, we developed a concept around digital IDs. And the idea is to test a solution that can, uh, can support people that are not legally recognized to have a digital ID and receive cash transfer in the event of an emergency. And this is one of two projects that we have implemented in recently in the last year and a half that look at a digital ID. 
The one that we did last year called the one to one was actually designed by the Netherlands Red Cross. And that looked more at the digital identity for cash transfer, but not so much at targeting those without an ID. So now we've progressed to seeing to incorporating or including people without a digital ID. And some of the challenges or I'd say conversations that we've started to have are around data protection. So as we look to become more efficient and as we look to use technology, how do we ensure that the data that we're collecting is going to be safe and secure and that we can assure our communities that their data is not going to be used for any other purpose than what it is being collected. And so the Kenya Red Cross, together with uh, the data protection uh, team, have developed a policy uh, that we're working um, that we're working under. But also Kenya as a country has also taken a very strong stance on data protection and have actually set up a commission uh, to deal with it. Another challenge that we've been having is around digital literacy. So as we progress to doing mobile money transfer or having um, community members or per persons affected actually having control over the data that they are submitting, how do we deal with uh, low digital literacy rates? And how do we make sure that as we go forward on that, we're, we're not ending up leaving people behind? And that's something that we've also been trying to grapple with and ensure that it stays at the at the center of our of our minds that as we develop these tech solutions how do we make sure that people are comfortable using it and so what we've learned and what we've started doing is making sure that the end users are involved in every single process but also we're doing multiple tests with um, our target communities so that in the that they've had time to interact with the solution, they've learned how to use it. And it's not something that's new to them when we're actually piloting it. So I think the lesson we're learning from there is that user, the end user has to be involved in every process, but not only when at certain times, but throughout the entire process. So they have time to get familiar with the tech. Another challenge uh, that we've been having is around this whole concept of uh, know your customer and the regulations that exist at the, at the national level. And how do we engage in conversation with regu regulators, with uh, um, the government to make sure that in the event of an emergency, know your customer uh, rules or regulations are made flexible or eased up so that people without digital IDs can be allowed to register themselves to receive humanitarian assistance. Um, there are a lot of legal issues around this, and this is something that we are discussing and have brought on board a few stakeholders to see how as humanitarian organizations we can work through this, um, through the KYC regulations. And then another um, aspect that we are dealing with is uh, this whole concept of interoperability. So how do we design solutions and how do we get stakeholders, partners, other humanitarian organizations on the table so that we can design a solution that is applicable and relevant to the humanitarian organizations that are working within these communities? Um, and we don't want to invest in something or pilot something that's only relevant to the Kenya Red Cross. It doesn't uh, make sense for us. So those are some of the, the I'd say, lessons learned experiences that we've been having uh, implementing digital ID. And our hope is that as we continue doing this, we will find a solution that ensures effective and efficient humanitarian assistance uh, delivery and something that makes sure that there is nobody left behind. Thank you and back to you, Adam. Thanks so much, Safia. So now I'm really excited to get into a discussion with all of these panelists. I'm gonna address each question to one of you just to get us started, but I wanna invite all of you to contribute to each question as you please. So this first question, Dakota, let's start with you. Um, Safia just mentioned governments, uh, they came up in ecosystem conversations earlier. What role should governments play in the future of digital identity? So I think um, there's sort of two things to think about. The first is that 
Now, when we think about digital ID, we're thinking about digital credentials, and there are multiple different forms of credentials that we each carry in our wallet at the moment. Um, and as we think about sort of a future of good digital ID, we imagine the same um, individuals carrying multiple forms of different digital credentials that are useful in different contexts. And some of those may be a state issued, government issued form of um, identity, i.e., uh, sort of a you know a driver's license, a um, other form of foundational ID. And there, of course, nobody but the government can play um, the sort of the leading role. Um, and so we really encourage governments um, to be thinking very proactively, not only about um, you know the potential for digital identity and and the necessary digital infrastructure that needs to be created, um, but also to think about how they are participating in an ecosystem of credentials issued um, by others, and that it may have utility in different use cases. So that's the that's sort of the first thing I'd raise. The second is that um, legal and regulatory frameworks surrounding the use of digital ID um, incredibly important. Um, you know, we've seen in many countries around the world. Um, where privacy legislation was not in place before digital ID programs were implemented. Um, there was often sort of a race to then implement um, necessary privacy protections and, and um, legal frameworks after the fact. And so that's a, a place where policymakers, I think, have an incredibly important place and, and role to play. Um, for the use case I touched upon in my opening remarks around um, COVID-19 um, and, and health status credentials, one of the many, many important policy questions that um, I think governments are reckoning with at the moment is around the use cases um, where it is appropriate or inappropriate to ask um, or require a, a COVID-19 um, health status credential. Um, we don't have much guidance on this at the moment, um, but it's something that I think, you know, we, we know that the technology is being developed. We know that organizations like the WHO and the European Commission are moving forward with um, vaccine passports, um, and yet we don't have that guidance that we need in terms of where can those be asked for um, and where they cannot be asked for. So a few things I'd highlight there. Does anyone else want to step in on the government question? Yeah, this is, um, I can just add a couple of additional points that I think complement Dakota's. You know, as she noted, for the time being, there are going to be state-led uh, national ID systems in many places. And I think in those cases, we really should look at states to lead with a good example. I think a couple of, of important characteristics there mean prioritizing consideration for safety and seclusion, inclusion of groups that may have been historically excluded. So even though a lot of these are stood up with the idea of inclusion, really following through in the implementation of what that looks like and making sure that you have registration points that are accessible to those who may be rural and, and far away, making sure you have um, important cultural considerations that go into making that process comfortable for them in terms of thinking about making sure those privacy and data protection protocols are in place. The other thing I would say is also considering that design, you know, we are thinking about these ecosystems and it's very easy to um, think about them from the perspective of the organization standing up the system and really thinking about what do we need to do to make sure this is actually useful for the individuals that we're asking to enroll in it. Um, making sure one that they, they trust it, that it's safe, that there are adequate safeguards to protect from misuse and that there is a real use case and motivation for them to be um, participating in it. And then I would also say, even in cases where it's, it's not their own system, there is a role in thinking about mechanisms for redress, right? If there are cases where a misidentification is going to mean that you miss a critical service or that some of your information is recorded incorrectly, it's really important to have opportunities to correct that. And I think states have a role to play to make sure that there are channels for that to happen. Thanks, Amy. So let me address this next question to you, actually. Are we waiting on any breakthrough innovations before we can proceed? Yeah, so I think, um, I'm sure others will have thoughts on this too. I think in our experience, a lot of it comes down to um, the capacity and the motivation that you have to actually implement the good practices that we have, right? A lot about privacy protections and securing information and designing with the user and working on these things um, like developing trust have a technology component, but more often than not, it really comes down to, are we organizing ourselves in a way where we are meaningful in implementing them, right? That means building capacity of local stakeholders to uh, understand what data protections means, to have the ability to follow through with encryption, to have access to um, secure and, and well-trained cybersecurity staff, 
Um, in terms of the privacy piece, it means thinking about are we serious about digital literacy and informing individuals about what's going to happen with their information and creating an environment in which they can make informed choices about how to share it. Um, again, there are, there are lots of technology components, but I think right now most of the challenges that we experience are really on the capacity and implication and prioritizing those kind of softer elements of the system to make sure that, that the tech we have does what we want it to. Safia, let me direct this next question to you to start with. So discussions about digital identity often include or even center on warnings uh, about potential consequences. Why does digital ID feel like it's so fraught with danger sometimes? Well, to answer your question, Adam, I think from where I sit, uh, implementing digital IDs uh, at the within communities, I think the the worry is that our data protection um, understanding frameworks legislation aren't uh, established enough to keep up with the speed in which digital ID is evolving, um, especially for humanitarian organizations. Uh, as we are, you know, incorporating all this emerging technology, do we have systems? and frameworks in place uh, that can help us to protect um, the data that we're collecting of um, you know disaster affected populations so i think for us that's the that's the biggest worry and maybe from looking outside the humanitarian angle national governments and other stakeholders and regulators are concerned about what could happen if um, a digital identity is, um, you know, used for for malicious activities, or it's given to somebody that doesn't qualify for, you know, legal documentation. Uh, what happens then? And maybe some of these aspects or challenges are not um, like all scenarios haven't been thought through yet um, because we don't know what else uh, the tech can can uh, can do. So I think that would be um, the challenges that we or the concerns that we we face as um as as a country that's uh, incorporating digital identities. Perhaps one additional thought on some of the risks and why conversations around digital ID do so often center on the risks. I think the first is, you know, as Safia was just saying, is that there's incredible urgency at many levels to close the identity cap quickly and by you know, harnessing the power of information technology to address it digitally. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, there's a rub in that. Um, if we simply rush to close the identity gap and provide you know, the over 1 billion people without any form of ID with some form of identification, but do so without paying heed to data protection and privacy, the risks are um, enormous. Um, so much so that I think, you know, I'd, I'd venture to say that a poorly designed digital ID program is more dangerous than no ID at all. Um, there are two really important and quite distinct risks that we we talk about. The first is the risk of misuse. Um, and, you know, when we think about the risk of misuse, that is data that is, um, you know, doesn't have sufficient data protection and therefore is easily hacked information um, that is, um, used for surveillance or um, any number of, um, you know, very real concerns. Um, you know, at the most egregious, and I don't mean to sound, um, you know, overly dramatic, but you know, these could range from discrimination and denial of due process rights to the facilitation of, of ethnic cleansing and genocide. I mean, really, any time personal information is collected, there is this risk of um, misuse, and then the, there's this risk of missed use. Um, and when we think about that, there's this risk of exclusion as these systems become more and more embedded in our daily lives. So if somebody doesn't have a way of proving who they are, as more and more services require proof identity, there's a greater and greater risk that they're cut off from services they need. Um, and so we need to be thinking both about how we avoid leaving people behind, um, but also how we ensure that the systems that are being implemented are being implemented with sufficient care, sufficient guardrails around them, um, that these risks of misuse are um, thoroughly mitigated. I'd like to pose one final question to each of you. And 
I'd like to start with Julio. What would you like to ask or tell the viewers of this session, the people who are building identity into digital products and services right now? The main question that that I will uh, that will I will want everyone to ask themselves is look at it from the perspective of of the most vulnerable, the the most vulnerable and the least uh, digitally lucky person on earth. The humanitarian lens is is not just useful; it's needed. Um, and and again, I'm not trying to make a business case out of of personal tragedies of people. It's it's literally because these people want to have access to services, and and digital ID could help them, but not as long as we design for the market target audience, which is mass adoption. So my main, the question that I would love everyone to ask is, are we designing for everyone or are we design, designing for everyone everywhere? And believe me, it's definitely not the same. Thanks, Julia. Amy, would you like to go next? So I, I would say um, something I think I heard Dakota say earlier, but I, I think this is an area where the motto of moving fast and breaking things is definitely not what we want to prioritize. As, as you've heard from the panelists today, these ecosystems are complex, right? Even within the digital sphere of thinking about the infrastructure and digital literacy to privacy to uh, digital economy and use cases is complex, but these are existing in complex social and political systems as well, right? And it really is worth the time to take that ecosystem approach to understand the different motivations of different stakeholders and actors within it and, and think very carefully about how your product is going to fit within that, um, whether it's whether it's a you know business product or through a development program or a state system or otherwise, um, taking that ecosystem approach. Thanks, Amy. Safia, over to you. For me, I'd say the most important thing to keep in mind or to incorporate is uh, the participation and feedback from the end users. Um, we all have this uh, sort of ambition to create like the most technology savvy, sophisticated uh, solution um, that will look really cool. But I, th I think that for the communities that we are designing for, especially for the humanitarian context, um, simple is better um, because that will make sure that um, everybody is included, everybody can use it, everybody can understand it and be comfortable with it. So uh, my ask would be to create something simple, easy to use, um, able to use in low connectivity settings, um, able to use in high temperatures, um, something that uh, is, you know, can be can be used by multiple organizations across borders, um, and that you know, uh, end users are involved every step of the way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dakota. Take us home. Well, I'll pick up where Sophia left off. I'd say, you know, completely agree with her on the need and the importance of solutions that are intuitive, that are inclusive. Um, what I'd add to that is two additional things. The first is that. Simple is good, but it still needs to exceed the thresholds that we've set for privacy and for user management. Um, so, you know, I don't think we should be willing to trade. Um, I would say it's non-negotiable. We cannot trade privacy uh, for simplicity. Um, and so, you know, I think that thinking about how solutions can be developed that um, have all of the protections that we need for privacy and for user management of their own data, but also are simple and easy to use is um, really sort of uh, at the center of what we do. And then finally, um, the last piece is that you know, these solutions are only useful if they're recognized and trusted widely, um, and that requires standards. And so when we think about how you know, any one of these solutions are taken forward, I'd sort of make a plea to those in the technology community to be thinking about open standards um, so that the solutions that you are developing are, uh, are interoperable with the solutions that others are developing and therefore you know, can be widely used. Thank you all so much. In closing, I want to thank Dakota Gruner from ID2020, Safia Vergi from Kenya Red Cross, Julio Coppi from the NRC, and Dr. Amy Paul from USAID. I encourage everyone watching to follow these organizations and to support their work. Thanks for tuning into this session. We'll stick around in the live chat for a few minutes if you have any questions. And thank you for attending Octane 21.